Good evening. Welcome to a discussion of the uses and limitations of provenance research presented by the Wildenstein Plattner Institute and the Collier Research Institute. Thanks for being here. I'm David Darcy, correspondent for the art newspaper. We'll hear from three speakers, then I'll moderate questions and answers with our speakers. For those of you who have questions, please write them and place them in the Q&A section of your screen and not in the chat section. Now I'll introduce our speakers in the order that you'll hear from them. Elizabeth Gorea is executive director of the Wildenstein Plattner Institute, Incorporated, a nonprofit art historical research foundation based in New York. As the WPI's founding director, Elizabeth oversees the production of digital catalog raisonné for artists including Jasper Johns, Paul Gauguin, Claude Monet, and Spearheads, a major digitization event of art historical archives and documentation. Formerly Senior Vice President and Senior Specialist in the Impressionist and Modern Art Department at Sotheby's, she led provenance research and restitution projects in London, Paris, and New York. Elizabeth has lectured widely about attribution and provenance research, including presentations in Antwerp, Buenos Aires, London, Montreal, Potsdam, Tokyo, and Toronto, and at Columbia Law School and the American Bar Association in the US. Jane Collier is president of the Collier Research Institute, a foundation established in 2017 to continue the scholarly research of her grandfather, Otto Collier. Jane is the author of the Catalogue Raisonne, Egon Schiele, The Complete Works, and many other publications on fin de siècle Austrian art. She has curated exhibitions for numerous museums in the US, East Asia, and Europe, including the National, National Gallery of Art in Washington, the Hungaram Museum in Seoul, the Belvedere and Wien Museums in Vienna, and the Museo del Vittoriano in Rome. Jane served as the government's expert witness in the case involving Sheila's looted painting, Portrait of Vali. William Sharon co-chairs Prior Cashman's art law practice. He's also an adjunct professor of art law at the University of Virginia School of Law, and he is the founder of the recently launched Court of Arbitration for Art in The Hague. Bill has been recognized by the New York Law Journal as a New York trailblazer for his groundbreaking work developing the Court of Arbitration for Art. He's also been repeatedly ranked as a band one attorney in the field of art and cultural property law by Chambers. Bill is a preeminent attorney in matters of art restitution. He frequently lectures and writes on issues impacting the art world, including and particularly World War II era restitution cases. Bill handled a seminal case that he will discuss this evening called Bacalar v. Vavra, which dealt with a Sheila collection that was alleged to have been looted by the Nazis. Elizabeth? Thank you very much, David. Let me share my screen. All right, thanks again, David. Um, I'm going to begin tonight's event with a general overview uh, of the matters concerning provenance research. Provenance research, as most people know, is a relatively new endeavor in the field of art history. This focus of inquiry has gained popularity over the last two decades, arising largely from the concerns of art collectors and the art market. Considering the risks of potential title and authenticity claims, and of course, being uneasy with open questions, buyers and sellers often require a seamless account of ownership history before finalizing a transaction. A century ago, few players in the art market would ever have anticipated, would never have anticipated the need for such rock solid accountancy. This is clear looking at the primary sources from that era. You're looking right now at one of the stock book pages in the uh, stock book of, of the, deal, the impressionist dealer, Ambroise, Ambroise Vollard. Um, and Vollard, as you can see, was not always a consistent or detailed accountant of transactions. Um, sometimes they're not even legible. Um, in other cases, auction catalogs- hey, Liz, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, it, 
you, the screen isn't sharing. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Let's see. Yeah. I apologize for that. Okay, better? Great. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so here's the Voilard stock book, as I mentioned, um, and you can see it's, it's semi-legible, not necessarily consistent, and not very detailed. And this is dating from about, um, I believe, 1903 uh, or 1904. Uh, the next slide is showing you an auction catalog also from that same time period. And you can see from that catalog, it is also similarly scant of information. Um, it lists the works of art with little more than their titles. Furthermore, the names of past owners were not commonly relayed as part of these transactions, as rarely was this information of primary interest to art historical research or to the public at large. It was accepted that transactional records may be unrecoverable and a successful sale of a painting was not contingent upon an unbroken chain of ownership. But today existing under a cloud of uncertainty is not the cultural preference and gaps in the provenance are a cause for anxiety. As we'll discuss this evening, attempts to fill these gaps don't always yield reliable results. My organization, the Wildenstein Plattner Institute, produces catalog raisonnés that link documentation stored in our vast digital archives. This archive includes digitized copies of art historical records collected over a half a century by George and Daniel Wildenstein. Visitors to our website, wpi.art, can freely access over 20,000 plus historic sales catalogs browse through impressionist dealers' records and scholars' notes, and view century-old exhibition catalogs. Now, when I first became acquainted with the archive, it was emphasized to me that none of this material was ever to be intended uh, for access to anyone other than the Institute's own staff, who were using it for their own catalog raisonné research. The Institute's internal teams of documentalists and art historians had a nuanced understanding of the archive as a working tool and were well-versed in the inherent mistakes, the misleading annotations and anecdotes about the agents involved in compiling the documentation. This same archive, which is now available in part to the public, was not created or formatted with the intent of becoming a repository of provenance data. It was with this archive though, that we were able to produce the first volume of the digital Gauguin catalog raisonné, accessible on our website and released in early 2021. Although this catalog was in production for four decades, it was only over the last three years that our researchers analyzed the data available in an attempt to verify the provenance of each work from artist to the present owner. When possible, art historical data points or printed lines of provenance or citations of exhibitions are hyperlinked to archival information that validates the reference. So here you're seeing uh, the provenance listed as one customarily sees provenance, um, but by clicking on the little circular bubbles, um, you're taken to the stock book, the citation for the very stock book and an image of the stock book that's in our archive. But in the absence of these critical records, such as invoices or bills of lading, our art historians relied on their in-depth understanding of the artist's practice, writings, and preferences to draw conclusions and make hypotheses about provenance. By cross-referencing go, go, cross Gauguin's notes in the margins of his written correspondence with our researchers' precise understanding of his corpus, our, they were able to reconstitute the shipping manifest of paintings sent from Tahiti to Paris. Now, as you can see, again, we're dealing with something that was written in the margin of a letter to Gauguin's lawyer. It was not uh, specifically listed as, listed as the shipping manifest, um, but nonetheless, considering the archive holistically, our researchers were able to determine what this was. 
Another prominent example of scholarly hypothesizing is the provenance for Gauguin's Du Tahitien sur la plage at the Musée d'Orsay in Paris. The published provenance here is based on an analysis of what happened with other pictures produced around the same time, not any specific transaction record. And since the collecting practices of women at the turn of the century are largely undocumented and yet to be thoroughly investigated by art historians, the role of the mysterious Madame Wilmot will remain a question mark as it is on the uh, website of the Orsay. It's also important to consider that when documentation does exist in an archive, it might be slapdash, anachronistic or erroneous. Recognizing these inconsistencies requires a comprehensive analysis of all of these materials. We came across this issue in the case of Gauguin's four pictures formerly in the possession of the collector, Edouard Polagino. Um, you can see them here on the left. The late art historian, Douglas Cooper, who worked on the Gauguin catalog raisonné in the 1970s at the Wildenstein Institute, disavowed the authenticity of these paintings based on his interview with Jeannot's children. In Cooper's recap of this meeting, which is now in the WPI archives, and you're seeing it on the right, uh, he writes that Jeannot himself was the artist, not Gauguin. But Cooper's notes were not a transcription of the actual interview with the children. They were a summary of his own conclusions and with his own slant on events that transpired. The scholar Sylvie Croussard, who worked with Cooper at that time and who is still working at WPI in Paris, explained to us that Cooper was a bit of a bombast and quick to editorialize during a fact-finding mission and dismiss works without ever seeing them in person. While some have taken Cooper's written record as a definitive rejection confirmed by Genot, the Genot children, we know that Cooper's notes were highly subjective and the, that he only ever saw black and white reproductions of the Genot paintings. These records were not definitive, a definitive account of the provenance of the pictures, despite Cooper's celebrated reputation as a connoisseur and scholar. But had these documents been consulted without Sylvie Crusard's insight and soft evidence of verbal anecdote, perhaps they would have led us to a different conclusion. Sometimes the only way to clarify what actually happened is to ask an eyewitness. Even the most authoritative archives and primary sources can originate a cascade of misinformation, leading the researcher to dead ends and misguided conclusions. For example, a dealer stock book where the work is listed among the stock, but was actually on consignment and returned to the owner unsold. Or a listing of a collection where an unillustrated work is indistinguishable in description from several others with the same title, as is the case of the countless Renoir still lives entitled Fleur. Uh, another case um, could be and has been in the past in our research a 19th century will that references bequests to the wife, but conveniently makes no mention of the one painting that was quietly given to the mistress. This is all to say that when looking at any record of provenance, human error cannot be ruled out nor should we forget the impulse to draw quick conclusions or overlook possible motivations to shoehorn information that tells a better story. The expertise of art historians well-versed in the idiosyncrasies of archives is essential in interpreting this material, as is the recognition that certain archival repositories were not formatted, edited or compiled with these queries in mind. These are just some of the considerations we should make when relying upon 19th and early 20th century archival materials to remedy 21st century concerns. Now, while these observations may seem elementary to experienced historians, their importance cannot be overstated. This brings us to the issue of, of ownership history of objects looted during the Second World War and the frenzy of research in this high stakes field over the years. When faced with resolving time sensitive and sensational provenance emergencies such as these, careful consideration and responsible scholarly practices should not fall to the wayside. There is always a temptation amidst the excitement and urgency to lean on easy answers or to construct historical truisms 
that would otherwise remain open questions. Now I'd like to turn the screen over to Jane, who will be speaking about these matters more specifically. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Let's just see if I can get this to work. Do, do, do. Let's see. Okay, we're on. Yes, everybody can see my screen? Yes. Yes. And you can hear me, yes? Yes. No. Very yes. well. Fabulous. Okay. Uh, thanks again, um, speakers, participants, um, for joining us here this evening. Um, provenance, uh, which is generally defined as the history of an artwork's ownership, was traditionally used by art historians to help establish authenticity, ideally by linking an artwork directly back to the artist. Uh, but as Elizabeth noted, today provenance research is also frequently used by museums, collectors, dealers, and others to attempt to identify works that were looted by the Nazis. However, provenance wasn't historically intended to document title, and it can't easily be bent to that purpose so many years after the work in question was created. I'm a child and a grandchild of Holocaust refugees, and as such, I'm proud to say that I helped to foster the current awareness of unrestituted Nazi plunder. I provided background material to the journalist Andrew Decker when he was researching his landmark 1984 article, Legacy of Shame. And my catalog resume, Egon Sheila, The Complete Works, uh, which was originally published in 1990, was the first book of its kind to include an appendix, Who's Who in the Provenances, specifically referencing spoliation. In 1997, when the Museum of Modern Art was hosting a show Ooh, how did that happen? Subtitles are on. That's weird. Okay, never mind. Uh, in 1997, when the Museum of Modern Art was hosting a show of Sheila's belonging to Vienna's Leopold Museum, I gave a series of letters documenting the theft of one of those paintings, Portrait of Vali, to the New York Times. The letters were written by Leah Bondi Yarai, who owned Vienna's Gallery Wurtle prior to the Anschluss, to my grandfather, Otto Kallir, who, like her, was an Austrian gallerist driven into exile by the Nazis. Dating to 1966, the letters described how Bondi's Sheila had been taken from her by the Nazi dealer Friedrich Feltz. Quote, Feltz came to see me in 1939, a few days before we were supposed to leave Vienna, Bondi wrote. He saw the Sheila painting hanging on my wall and demanded that I give it to him. I explained to him that the painting was my private property and had nothing to do with Wurtle, which Feltz had previously Aryanized. He continued to pressure me in an extremely unpleasant manner until finally my husband said, give it to him already. We may want to leave as soon as tomorrow and we don't need any complications. You know what he's capable of. Bondi's letters became the lead in to a lengthy New York Times article published on Christmas Eve, 1997. A few days later, the self-identified heirs of the murdered Austrian collector Fritz Grunbaum put in a claim for another Sheila painting, Dead City Three, which was also in the MoMA show. In early January, 1998, New York's district attorney subpoenaed both Sheilas. The seizure of the Leopold Museum's Sheilas created a furor in Austria. In response, the Ministry of Education, Science and Culture 
opened previously sealed institutional archives and established a commission to investigate the provenances of art in Austria's federal museums. On September 25th, 1998, the Austrian parliament became the first governing body since the immediate post-war period to enact legislation regarding current restitution claims. In December of that same year, the Washington Conference on Holocaust Era Assets issued a set of principles intended to establish international standards for adjudicating Holocaust related art claims. Nevertheless, it took 12 years before the Bali case was resolved. Dead City had, in the meantime, been sent back to Vienna, presumably due to lack of evidence. In 2010, just days before trial was set to begin, the Leopold Museum capitulated and paid Bondi's heirs $19 million, the equivalent of Vali's estimated market value. The notoriety of the Vali case and the magnitude of the settlement have since made Egon Schiele something of a poster child for Nazi looted art claims. Nonetheless, although the artist has been the subject of extensive provenance research, most of the findings are ambiguous. Sheila oil paintings, such as Portrait of Vali, are relatively well documented up until 1930 when Otto Collier published the first catalogue raisonne of those works. Unlike watercolors and drawings, Oils were mentioned by name in the artist's correspondence and prominently featured in exhibitions, both during his lifetime and after his death in 1918. It therefore wasn't difficult for my grandfather to construct fairly accurate provenances for the paintings, because most of them still belonged to collectors who acquired them directly from Sheila or to his estate. After 1930, however, it becomes much harder to establish seamless chains of ownership for most of Sheila's oeuvre, much less to determine in each instance precisely when and how a work changed hands. Relatively few records of transfer were preserved, even for the more valuable oils, and some transfers, such as gifts or exchanges, were never recorded at all. Sheila's works on paper, which number in the thousands, are almost impossible to track. The artist himself seldom titled these works and therefore they were rarely inventoried in an identifiable manner. In some of the earliest catalogs and lists, works on paper are merely counted. So for example, you find references like 20 drawings with no further indication of subject, date, size, or specific medium. Watercolors and drawings weren't routinely illustrated in books or catalogs until the 1970s. Collections were seldom comprehensively photographed. Early provenances for Sheila's works on paper often have to be reconstructed by matching unillustrated records like inventories and exhibition checklists with images. This can pose insurmountable challenges because the subjects are repetitive and most titles are merely descriptive. For example, as here, nude study or portrait study or just study. Moreover, titles usually invented by dealers or collectors often changed over time and unillustrated records aren't always accurate with regard to details such as size, date, or medium. The low value of Sheila's work before, during, and immediately after World War II further discouraged record keeping. Following a brief efflorescence in the 1920s, the Sheila market succumbed to a combination of economic malaise and the aesthetic conservatism that accompanied the fascist regime of Engelbert Dollfuss, who was Austria's chancellor from 1932 to 34. Between 1930 and 1932, the artist's prices dropped by about 80%. 
Because it had so little value and was incompatible with Nazi tastes, Sheila's art wasn't especially targeted for looting. Rather, it may be viewed as collateral damage inadvertently swept up in the Nazis' misappropriation of larger tranches of presumably more desirable Jewish property. The Doratam, the state-run auction house that served as a conduit for art seized from Jews, sold only two Sheila oils during the Nazi period. Houses by the sea, which had belonged to the collector Jenny Steiner, bought in twice before being knocked down for 650 Reichsmarks in 1941, which is the equivalent today of about $4,000. A second work seized from Steiner, mother with two children, was deemed unfit for sale and instead relegated to the Nazi propaganda office. The other Sheila painting sold at the Doratheum during this period was Krumau Landscape, which had belonged to, she to Steiner's daughter, Daisy Hellmann. It brought 1,800 Reichsmarks in 1942, uh, the present day equivalent of about $10,000. But when, after years of thwarted efforts, the work was finally restituted to Hellman's heirs in 2003, it sold for $20 million at Sotheby's, an increase adjusted for inflation of 200,000%. The price increase for Sheila works on paper, which in the 1930s and 40s were selling for the present day equivalent of a few hundred dollars is even more astounding. In 1957, major Sheila watercolors were selling for $600. By 1965, the cost of such works had risen to $8,000 and by 1970 to $18,000. These prices today would be equivalent to roughly $6,000, $70,000, and $130,000, respectively. In 1978, for the first time, a Sheila watercolor brought over $100,000 at auction. But today, top Sheila watercolors command in excess of $10 million. Adjusted for inflation, that's an increase since the 1940s of about 5 million percent. Rising prices increased the financial risk posed by Sheila Fakes, and that's one of the reasons I decided to compile the first catalog resume of the artist's works on paper. The higher prices also made my job easier because Sheila watercolors and drawings were now better documented than had formerly been the case. Still, compiling the provenances for Egon Sheila, the complete works, was not a simple task. task. First issued in 1990, my catalog resume was expanded in 1998, and updated entries for the oils were published online in 2018. We're presently in the process of updating the provenances for the watercolors and drawings. However, even with access to the archival information that became available after 1998, it's impossible to reconstruct complete chains of ownership for most of Sheila's works on paper. The problems confronting today's provenance researchers are illustrated by the case of Heinrich Rieger, a major Sheila collector who, together with his wife, Bertha, perished in the Holocaust. Rieger, a successful dentist, apparently began collecting Sheila's work around 1916, when he offered to trade dental services for art. In 1917, Sheila made portrait drawings of Heinrich as well as his daughter, Antonia, and his son, Robert. The first known inventory of Rieger's Sheila collection, prepared in 1921, itemizes over 600 artworks by diverse artists. 10 Sheila oils and two works on paper are listed by name. As was typical at the time, 
The remaining Sheila drawings, 50 Sheila drawings are merely counted. Uh, and you can uh, find these, if you wanna just quickly see, these are numbers 300 through 308. And then you see at 558 uh, to what should be 508, not 608, you've got, uh, or rather 608 to 658, you've got the 50 Sheila drawings. Otto Kalir's 1930 Sheila catalog resume names Heinrich Rieger as the owner of 11 oils, 10 of which are illustrated. While one might assume that all but one of those 11 works already belonged to Rieger in 1921, some of the titles on the 1921 inventory list are too generic to permit a definitive match. The titles of Sheila's drawings and watercolors are considerably more generic than those of the oils, and that makes it much more difficult to pair specific works with unillustrated listings. Here, for example, is a page from the catalog of a 1925 Sheila show at the Gallery Wirtle. Rieger is listed as the owner of items 91, 95, 104, and 107. But titles like Seated Woman or Sleeping Man aren't in themselves sufficient to permit identification of the work in question. All told, 32 Sheila works on paper can be traced to Heinrich Rieger through reproductions in various pre-war publications. These publications, however, establish ownership only as of the date of publication. They don't tell us whether Rieger still owned a given work at the time of the 1938 Nazi Anschluss or what became of it thereafter. In January 1928, Rieger petitioned the Federal Monuments Office to provide him with a space in which to exhibit a portion of his collection. He was now sharing his dental practice with his son, Robert, and his son-in-law, Fritz Ticho, and needed to make alternative arrangements for the art that had previously been stored there. According to a contemporaneous inventory prepared by the collector, he now owned 150 Sheila works on paper. The Monuments Office denied Rieger's request, and in October 1928, 120 of his Sheila works on paper were exhibited at the Neue Gallery, my grandfather's Vienna Gallery. A collection inventory prepared by Rieger 10 years later, in November 1938, mentions six Sheila oils by name, plus six quote unquote oil studies. One of the 12 paintings had been inquired since the publication of the 1930 catalog resume. The others appear to be accounted for in my grandfather's book, though it's hard to be 100% certain with regard to the generically described oil studies. From a peak of 150 works in 1928, however, the total number of Sheila watercolors and drawings owned by Heinrich Rieger had, by November 1938, dropped to, quote unquote, circa 80. The question, impossible to fully answer, is what happened to the other 70 Sheilas? Heinrich Rieger certainly sold some of his Sheila drawings and watercolors between 1928 and 1938, although only a few specific sales can at this time be documented. He also probably gave a number of these works to his son, Robert, who immigrated to New York, and to his son-in-law, Fritz Tisho, who immigrated to Palestine. Robert's 1938 export license permitted him to export quote unquote, 10 oil paintings, five drawings, four pastels, three graphics, and a portfolio with various modern graphics and watercolors. 
Fritz's export license lists, quote unquote, 17 oil paintings, five watercolors, five drawings, five graphics, and one portfolio. Sheila's work was worth so little at the time that it's seldom described in detail on refugees' export permits. And unframed drawings were often kept in portfolios whose contents weren't inventoried. In May 1942, Robert Rieger consigned 31 Sheila works on paper to Otto Collier's Gallery St. Etienne in New York. As owner of the Neue Gallery, my grandfather had been friendly with both Robert and Heinrich Rieger in Vienna. In 1944, the Gallery St. Etienne sold 12 of Robert's consigned Sheilers, but none of these can be specifically identified. In 1957, the Gallery St. Etienne purchased an additional 14 Sheila drawings from Robert Rieger, of which 11 can today be identified. Robert probably sold additional unidentifiable Sheila drawings to other New York dealers. The Ticho family in Palestine is also said to have had Sheila drawings, but so far none of those have been identified. So, what of the Rieger works that remained in Vienna. In 1947, Robert Rieger and Fritz Tichot's daughter, Tana, hired two Viennese law firms to locate and recover Heinrich Rieger's art. Each law firm immediately contacted Anna Lehrbaum, a relative still living in Vienna, who acted as a go-between among the various parties. The lawyers found no evidence that any portion of Rieger's vast collection had ever been formally seized by the Nazi authorities, but they soon learned that the more valuable works had been misappropriated by two Nazi art dealers, Luigi Casimir and Friedrich Feltz. Feltz, of course, is the same dealer who stole Portrait of Valle. In 1950, Two of Rieger's Sheila paintings, Cardinal and Nun and Embrace, were restituted to the collector's family by Veltz and subsequently sold by them to the Belvedere Museum. A third Sheila oil, Vision of St. Hubertus, remained with Casimir and was only restituted in 2012. For unknown reasons, the Allied forces who sorted through Veltz's loot after the war allowed him to retain four small early Sheila oils that had once belonged to Heinrich Rieger. Two of these ended up in Austrian museums and were restituted to the Rieger heirs in 2006. The wartime whereabouts of Rieger's other five Sheila oils remain unknown. Robert's lawyer, Christian Broda, didn't think that Rieger's Sheila drawings had been taken either by Veltz or by Casimir, but rather had remained with the collector until shortly before his deportation in 1942. And in fact, Heinrich's wife left a trunk containing, among other things, a quote unquote, portfolio with pictures with a non-Jewish relative. Robert Rieger believed the Sheilas were in that portfolio. While it isn't known if the portfolio was ever found, Broda's law partner, Oscar Mueller, offered a group of Sheila drawings that he said had been recovered on behalf of the Rieger family to the collector Rudolf Leopold in 1951. Leopold declined to buy any. A legal assistant who worked with Mueller and Broda at the time recalled that the law firm was storing a number of Rieger Sheila drawings. The assistant said these works were subsequently either picked up by or shipped to Robert Rieger. So to sum up, as of November, 1938, it seems Heinrich Rieger still had all 12 of his Sheila oil paintings. Five of these were eventually restituted. We don't know exactly what happened to the others during the years of Nazi rule. 
The situation with regard to Rieger's Sheila drawings and watercolors is far murkier. Even if one could identify all 150 works said to have been in the collection at its peak in 1928, it would be impossible to trace the fate of each one. Some were sold before 1938. Some were brought to the US by Robert Rieger and sold there. And some were probably brought to Palestine by the Tishos. Some may have been recovered and informally returned to the family after World War II. And some Rieger Sheila drawings were likely spoliated and never recovered. What can we do with this information? In my opinion, not much. Portrait of Ali, as it turns out, was an exceptionally well-documented case of Nazi theft. Seldom do you have an eyewitness account of a Nazi physically grabbing a painting off the wall. The ambiguity surrounding Heinrich Rieger's Schiele drawings is unfortunately much more typical. We'll probably never know exactly which Schiele works on paper remained with Rieger in 1938. And with the exception of the works that can be traced to Veltz or Casimir, we have no specific evidence of spoliation. Without this information, I think we must accept the fact that it may simply be too late to do anything constructive. Our next and final speaker, Bill Sharon, is going to discuss how the legal system has attempted to grapple with one such ambiguous case. Thank you, Jane. Um, pull up my screen as well. Okay. So I want to um, kind of tee off on, on Jane's point about the ambiguity uh, of, of provenance research. Uh, and when I was thinking about, you know, the title of this program, Limitations of Provenance Research, what comes to mind is a case that, uh, that I was involved in called Bacalar v. Vavra, involved a Sheila drawing. Uh, it was a case that went on for over eight years uh, through every level of the federal court system. I'm going to distill it down to about 15 minutes if I can uh, and take you on a little bit of a tour of what the evidence in that case looked like. And I think more significantly, what, what the court did with the evidence and, and what that says about the limitations uh, and uses of provenance research. Um, so the case involved uh, Fritz Grunbaum, whom Jane mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, uh, a, a well-known Sheila collector, uh, a, a Holocaust victim. He, uh, after the Anschluss, uh, tried to flee. He was arrested at the Czech border. Uh, he was imprisoned, uh, shipped between multiple concentration camps, murdered in 1941 in Dachau. Um, at the time of his arrest in March 1938, uh, his and what I'm going to show you is evidence from the case. These are um, uh, these are documents uh, from archives, which really highlight the importance of researchers. Uh, you know, these kinds of cases can't be done at all without without good quality research being done. Um, also, uh, you know, when the when the Iron Curtain fell, uh, and when um, archives started to come online. Uh, from, uh, from Germany, from Austria, from Russia, and when they became digitized, this kind of research became more available, which was very important. So that's why you saw the rise of these cases in the late 90s. Uh, Bacalar was a case that commenced in 2005, one of the earlier cases in this, in this space. Um, so when Fritz Grunbaum was arrested, his apartment was inventoried. Uh, this is uh, a copy of the inventory taken. Uh, and uh, the quality is poor, uh, but the first five items taken uh, are uh, all Aegon Sheila paintings, identified specifically by title. Uh, the third one, uh, which I'll, I'll mispronounce, but it's, I believe it's Stott and, and Flood. Uh, Jane can correct it. <laughs> um, but in any event, uh, it is Dead City 3, which Jane mentioned a short time of, ago. Uh, so Fritz Grunbaum is known to have owned Dead City 3, uh, which went by a different title uh, at the time, uh, at the time of his arrest. 
uh, again, the quality here is poor, but these things get um, these things get translated, which is how they become useful in the court. So here's the translation. You can see the third item, town by a river, dead city, again, today known as dead city three. Um, you can see that uh, Grunbaum was a major art collector uh, of multiple artists. Um, but if you, um, if you look, you'll see item 37, a little over halfway down this page says large drawings by Sheila, 55 works colored and 20 drawings in one print by Sheila. So uh, he had a uh, large drawing collection, 75 drawings in his collection, but they were not titled. Uh, and that was the significance to the, to the Bacalar case. Uh, this is Dead City, uh, Dead City 3, the painting that is known to have been owned by Grunbaum at the time of his arrest. Uh, this is the drawing that was at issue in Bacalar. Uh, I represented a, uh, a collector named David Bacalar. He owned this drawing. He had purchased it from the Gallery Saint-Étienne in the 1960s. Um, it is known as Seated Woman with Bent Left Leg or Torso. Uh, again, it's a work that changes titles based upon uh, ownership over time, but it tracks its description. Uh, so this is known as the Torso Drawing. Uh, Bacalar consigned this for sale uh, through Sotheby's. In early 2005, it was to be sold at auction in London, uh, and the sale was interrupted uh, by the heirs of Fritz Grunbaum, uh, who claimed that the torso drawing uh, was one of the 75 drawings owned by Fritz Grunbaum at the time of his arrest, uh, and that it had been stolen by the Nazis. And so the significance of the inventory uh, was that, um, you know, this was sort of all that was known uh, about um, what Grunbaum owned at the time. Uh, and the question was whether Torso was one of these 75 drawings. And the further question was, did the Nazis steal the drawing uh, or if it was owned by him or not? Um, and so the case really was about uh, Fritz Grunbaum uh, and his wife, Elizabeth or Lily Grunbaum. Um, who was also eventually arrested and murdered by the Nazis. Uh, they perished without any children, um, but uh, they, they each had siblings. Uh, Fritz had a sister, uh, and Lily had a sister and a brother, uh, a sister named Matilda Lukash uh, and a brother named Max Herzl. Matilda Lukash and her husband Sigmund both lived in Vienna, Austria, uh, as, as did the Grunbaums at the time. Max Herzl lived in Belgium. And through the research and through, through discovery in the case, what we learned was the following. Um, this is a copy of a power of attorney that Fritz Grunbaum was forced to execute while at Dachau. Um, however, he executed it not in favor of a Nazi, but in favor of his wife. Um, and so he executed his power of attorney, which gave his wife, Lily, uh, coexistent uh, authority over Fritz's property, including his art collection. Uh, and there was sort of, you know, you could, you, you could go on endlessly about the, the sickness of what the Nazis did, but they had this perverse fascination with formality uh, and, and, and legality. Uh, and so it was important to them that um, because they were charging these exorbitant taxes on Jewish families and, and whatnot, uh, if Fritz was detained in a concentration camp, well, he wasn't able uh, necessarily to do what the Nazis wanted to do uh, as, a, as a business matter. So it was important that power of attorney be transferred to someone uh, who was not arrested, and that was his wife. Um, what did Lily do with that power of attorney? Um, this is where uh, you know, the role of the courts becomes one of, um, of inference gathering of drawing conclusions. You know, the standard of proof, generally speaking, in a US court case is something called the preponderance of the evidence, meaning a more likely than not standard of proof. And so the courts are called upon in these cases to try to determine based upon the evidence that is presented to them. Courts are not proactive bodies. They don't go out and search themselves. They're reactive bodies. They take what the parties present to them and then they try to weigh that evidence. Uh, to a more likely than not standard. And so what was shown here was that Lily Grunbaum was permitted to export property, uh, her and Fritz's property. 
This is a copy of her export permit from 1938. Um, and the translation shows uh, that um, uh, they, they approved the emigration for Elizabeth Grunbaum uh, at their address of uh, 21 oil paintings, 15 watercolors, it goes on and on. And you can see 278 drawings, 10, 10 drawings as well. Basically, this equates to uh, nearly the entirety of the art collection that I showed you in the inventory a few slides ago. Um, so the Nazis approved the export of the art collection by Lilly. But what, what does that mean? Where did it go uh, and what happened? So what we also learned was as all of this was happening in 1938, Lily Grunbaum's brother, Max Herzl, who I mentioned was in Belgium, was furiously writing to the Belgian authorities, trying to get emigration visas for the Grunbaums and for the Lukashians. Uh, these are copies of letters that Max Herzl was writing, swearing that uh, this was gonna be a temporary situation that the Grunbaums and the Lukashes would not become wards of the state, that they had their own resources uh, and they could support themselves. Um, and Herzl was doing this because the Gestapo was telling Grunbaum that they were going to release him. Uh, now, you know, that may sound laughable uh, to, to hear today, but um, what had happened was the Gestapo had arrested Grunbaum. They had also arrested Sigmund Lukash right after the Anschluss. And uh, in the case of Lukash, they did release him. Uh, they forced him to sign something called a promise to leave Vienna, promise to leave Austria. They said, we're gonna let you go. The Nazis hadn't yet arrived at their final solution. They just knew that they didn't like the Jews and they wanted them out. Uh, and so they told the Lukashes, we're gonna let you go. And they did let him go but he had to go somewhere else. And that's why Max Herzl was trying to get emigration visas. They were telling the same thing to the Grunbaums. Uh, and you could actually see that uh, Lily was in correspondence with Fritz at the time of his detention. She visited him. Um, and uh, she, uh, so Max Herzl succeeds. He's able to get emigration visas for the Lukashes and for the Grunbaums. And what we also find through the documentation is that the Lukashes also were able to uh, export their property. Uh, these are documents showing uh, nearly the entire uh, property collection of the Lukashes being approved for export uh, to Belgium, uh, where the Lukashes did safely emigrate. We know this because after the war, uh, Sigmund Lukash filed his own restitution claim. Uh, and had described what had happened in his own words. And, and he indicated that they, they got out, the only items that he indicated were stolen were an emerald and cash. That's what he sought restitution over. But otherwise, uh, it appears uh, that the Lukashes were able to transport their property uh, safely to Belgium. Um, Lily Grunbaum made the fateful and tragic mistake of believing the Gestapo that they were also going to release Fritz. And so she had her export permit approved, but she did not leave Austria. She did not want to leave without her husband. Uh, and so while the Gestapo released Sigmund Lukash and allowed the Lukashes to emigrate, they never released Fritz. Uh, and as I said, they uh, eventually captured uh, Lily and they murdered them both. Um, so what does that mean in terms of the Bacalar case and the torso drawing? So uh, nothing is known about uh, the torso drawing. It's, it's uh, dated uh, by Sheila, um, but there's nothing that specifically shows that it was owned by Grunbaum ever, uh, unlike Dead City 3. Um, so you have to fast forward, uh, and these, that's Sigmund Lukash, that's Matilda Lukash, you have to fast forward to after the war. In the 1950s, in the mid 1950s, Matilda Lukash was corresponding with a dealer in Switzerland named Eberhard Kornfeld. She had corresponded with him over the course of several years. Um, and this is a particular letter uh, from 1955, August of 1955, where she wrote to Kornfeld and indicated that she had a substantial art collection, including a collection of Aegon Sheila works, 
And she asked if Kornfeld would be interested uh, in acquiring those works, purchasing those works. Kornfeld, who <clears throat> excuse me, is still alive today, he was in his 80s at the time of this case, uh, he voluntarily submitted to discovery in our case from Switzerland. Uh, that is no easy feat. It is not easy to take discovery from a Swiss citizen. Uh, the Swiss government is highly protective. And if a, a citizen does not want to give discovery, uh, they, are, they are well protected from having to do so. Even if they agree to give discovery, you need to jump through a lot of hoops, which we did in this case. And we um, took uh, Kornfeld's deposition in person in Switzerland, and he produced his documents, again, voluntarily, and they were available for, for personal inspection and, and copying. And so he had all of his records. He had years of correspondence with Matilda Lukash kept uh, with, um, you know, postmarks that don't exist at the time, uh, that don't exist today, uh, and, you know, some sort of some of the correspondence was about trivial matters. Was, I think one of my favorite pieces was uh, uh, Matilda wrote to Kornfeld to say she had just moved apartments and her new mailbox was too small to hold her catalog. So she wanted him to send his catalog somewhere else. So the correspondence really oozed uh, genuineness. Um, and Kornfeld also produced his handwritten ledgers of all of the art, uh, all of his transactions. And this is a page showing that in 1956, Kornfeld did purchase a number of Sheila works from Lukash. Uh, one of the works is Dead City 3, and the other, another of the works, and there were uh, over 50 that were purchased in total from her, another work is the torso drawing. And so that's really the key uh, to the case, uh, is that this is what showed that, um, uh, the, again, the first time the torso drawing really comes up on any evidence, any radar, is Kornfeld's acquisition of it in the 1950s. He had a catalog showing these works, uh, and he sold uh, torso to uh, the Gallery Saint Etienne, which again eventually sold it to our client, Mr. Bacalar. Uh, and so, if you credit Kornfeld's evidence and his testimony of having acquired the torso drawing from Lukash, then our theory of the case was actually pretty straightforward. If Fritz Grunbaum's sister-in-law had torso uh, after the war, then no matter what, the Nazis didn't steal it. Because whatever, you know, for everything the Nazis did, they did not steal property from uh, Jewish families only to give it back to the Jewish families or to another member of the family. And so um, you know, we, we had multiple arguments. One was, there was no evidence that Torso, no direct evidence that Torso was ever actually owned by Grunbaum. Um, Egon Schiele created well over 2000 drawings in his earth. So if you just play the numbers of whether Torso is one of the 75 drawings in Grunbaum's collection at the time of his arrest, there's only about a 2% chance uh, that, that torso was one of those 75 drawings. That is well less than the preponderance standard that I, that I talked about earlier, the more likely than not standard. And so there was nothing that tied torso directly. Indirectly, however, and as a matter of inference drawing, and this is uh, ultimately what the, the court in the Bacalar case found, is uh, our judge said, look, you know, what are the chances that Matilda Lukash sells Dead City 3 and the torso drawing at the same time in the same batch to Kornfeld, and Dead City 3 is known to have been owned by Grunbaum, what are the chances that torso was not? He, the, our judge basically formed an inference and, de and decided to a more likely than not standard that torso was also one of the, was also owned by Grunbaum. It was one of those 75 drawings, but also agreed that because Lukash had it after the war and our judge credited Kornfeld's evidence uh, as, as genuine, um, if, since Lukash had it after the war, it was not stolen by Nazis. Uh, and so in our case, we defended Mr. Bacalar's title uh, and he was able uh, to keep the torso uh, drawing. Uh, there's much more to the case uh, for, for another time, uh, but that's sort of the nub of it. Um, the reason that I say that this case introduces interesting 
uh, is a good illustration of the uses and limitations of provenance is because there's a postscript. It's a very active postscript. There's another case going on right now called Raifi Nagi. Um, and it was brought by the same heirs of uh, Fritz Grunbaum uh, who were involved in the Bacalar case, but they sued a different uh, uh, owner, uh, Richard Nagy, uh, with respect to two different Sheila works that also are part of the Lukash Kornfeld transactions. Um, instead of suing in federal court, uh, the Grunbaum heirs sued in New York state court in the Nagy case. And the state court, operating on all of the same evidence, drew a very different inference and conclusion and decided on the one hand, it credited uh, Kornfeld's evidence um, to say that, well, you know, these other drawings at issue in the Nagy case that, that came through these, uh, the same inventories and, and uh, Kornfeld's transactions with Lukash, that was sufficient to say that Grunbaum owned these other drawings as well. Um, but uh, the state court did not credit everything else Kornfeld said and reached a conclusion that there was Nazi theft of the other drawings. Um, and so there's this real schism between two different court systems operating on the same evidence, but drawing very different conclusions. Um, and all, you know, there's really, again, there's nothing that ties any of these drawings specifically to Grunbaum. The only thing that can be tied is Dead City 3. From there, it's a matter of drawing inferences. Uh, and, and I think that that really highlights the, the limitation. I, I, I would say that the limitation is, in a way, the, the, the court system itself. Uh, because you have the, the documents are what they are. The facts are what they are. The question is, how are they presented? Are they spun? And how is the trier of fact uh, inclined to um, interpret what is presented. Um, and, uh, you know, I'll just leave with uh, a, a quote by Mark Twain, uh, uh, something to the effect of never let the facts get in the way of a good story. Um, I don't mean to be cynical. Uh, the, uh, our justice system uh, is, it, it tries uh, in earnest. Uh, it's a very, obviously a very effective system in a lot of ways. But these cases and the ambiguity that Jane mentioned a short time ago present real, real challenges. Uh, and the result today uh, is that where you've got two very different results from the Bacalar and the Nagi cases, the market doesn't know what to do. Uh, you know, and I think that that does a disservice to the market in, as a whole. I should also, uh, in full disclosure, point out uh, that uh, Mr. Nagi retained me uh, to try to get um, the decision in his case reviewed uh, by the highest court in, in New York. Uh, and uh, so I will, uh, I will leave it at that. Um, but anyway, I, I do think that this case is a, is a great illustration of the uses and the limitations uh, of provenance research. And so I will, uh, with that, end and thank you all very much for your attention. Well, can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, wow. From Egon Sheila to the Holocaust to Mark Twain. And that's by no means the strangest itinerary of uh, art and dispute. So, all right. I see, I see a number of questions. Wow. So let's start. I'm sure. Thank you all. These presentations were great. All right. Uh, should, I, should I give the name of the questioner? Should we do that? Um, well, I don't hear anything, so I won't. Uh, what role does oral history or personal testimony play in your provenance research? And how do you document that information differently from that attained from written documentation? Who wants to take this one? Sounds like a good Elizabeth question. So yeah. the, the archivist as well as the researcher. Sure, sure. Um, my dog is barking, so. Sorry, that's in the background. Um, thanks for that question. In fact, at WPI, we are embarking on an oral history program where we're trying to interview as many of the um, catalog raisonné key players as possible, particularly 
um, the older ones because um, we do think that oral history is quite important for the documentation of provenance. Um, but how do we document that? We don't necessarily do it um, in the form of footnotes. Um, we try to be forthcoming with where our information originates. Um, but if we were to start leaving breadcrumbs um, for every uh, line of provenance, we would have just an entire loaf of bread. It would just, it, it, where do you stop? So we have, certainly we have internal notes, um, but for the sake of our readers, when we have a document, we show it. When we don't have a document, then certainly people can contact us um, and we can ex give the circuitous story and why we reasoned how we reasoned. Um, but frankly, that's the exercise of historians to come up with that circuitous reasoning. Um, and so to document that succinctly becomes problematic. But uh, to answer your question about how do we differentiate it, um, I think that just because something is written, it might have a particular luster, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's any truer or uh, falser than uh, an oral account. Um, if I can exercise the privilege of the moderator, <laughs> Bill, Bill, can you weigh in on that? Because, you know, it's sort of there's evidence and then there's evidence. Can you talk about that for a second? Sure, you know, and I think that it, it, taking it back to the Bacalar case, the the Im, the importance of of Kornfeld's testimony, um, you know, if he, he has his documents, uh, if he had just sent copies, if first of all, if he'd resisted, that would have presented a whole set of problems. If he had only sent copies, that could have presented another set of problems. But being able to uh, inspect the originals. Uh, in person and to ask him about it and to examine and cross-examine, very, very important. Um, I didn't get into, uh, you know, the legal doctrine that the Bacalar case is perhaps best known for, which is something called the Latches Doctrine, which is basically a doctrine that says that if, if too much time has passed, if the um, claimed victim of theft or their, or their descendants um, uh, knew of the ability to bring a claim sooner and did not do so. And the consequence of that delay is that critical evidence that is needed to prove or disprove what happened is now gone. Meaning, in particular, material firsthand witnesses are no longer available. They're, they're deceased uh, or, or simply otherwise unavailable. If you can't put on a case then that really implicates you know, what I refer to as a due process problem in our country. Everybody has the right to put on a case and we don't try cases and we don't reach results where we're not supposed to at least by speculation. Uh, it's supposed to be grounded in evidence. And so the firsthand accounts are hugely important. The absence of those firsthand accounts can be just as important in these cases under the Latches Doctrine. All right. We have a question saying, can, can we have the contact information of the speakers, please? Yes, uh, of course you can. Uh, I'd suggest you contact the institutions that sponsored this panel. Um, you'll, they'd be happy to supply you with that information. Next question. What's the relevance of the POA given to Lily? Can there be an inference that she sold their art collection to the Lukacs, Lukacs and that is why after Matilda sold the, that is why after Matilda sold the painting to the Swiss dealer. Um, Jane, well, or Bill, you want to, Bill. Well, right. Jane, I'm, I'm happy if you want to. Oh, no, you're, 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 the, you're the Grunbaum expert. I think you should uh, go so, on that one. So the POA, I, I believe, is referring to the power of attorney. Um, uh, that I showed that uh, Fritz uh, was forced to execute at Dachau. Um, and, and, you know, this is really, uh, uh, this is one of the more significant legal questions presented, not just in the Bacalar case, but more generally, this question of duress. Um, and, and the argument was made in the Bacalar case that the power of attorney, since Anything done in a concentration camp is, you can't call that voluntary. Um, so since the power of attorney was an involuntary act, basically everything that results from that 
should be viewed as an act of duress or, or theft uh, sufficient to lead to a conclusion that Nazi looting occurred. Um, and um, the, the problem with that argument, uh, which was not credited in the, in the federal court, was credited in the state court, um, is that you know, duress cases are, we, we can only operate off of the law that, that we have on the books. Uh, there is no code uh, that deals with art specifically. It's simply a uniform commercial code that applies to sales of goods in general. Uh, and also, unlike certain countries after the war, Austria, for example, after the war, passed a law called the Nullification Act, which basically automatically deemed any transaction that involved a Jewish family during the period of Nazi occupation was deemed to have been a duress act. And the burden shifted to a good, uh, a current owner to disprove uh, duress or, or theft. The US doesn't have a nullification, it never has. So we don't have that same kind of presumption. And so we have to look at, uh, you know, under the, our legal rubric, what is duress? Duress is you're, you're, you're forced to give over your property to, to the bad guy. Uh, and in this case, that didn't happen uh, because uh, it, the power of attorney was executed in favor of Lily. Um, and, and actually the power of attorney didn't even divest Fritz of his, uh, of his ownership rights. It gave coexistent authority. But where the evidence showed to a more likely than not standard, at least according to the Bacalar court, that the drawing avoided the Nazis, avoided the bad guys, avoided the thieves. It, it was not, uh, the courts were unwilling to say that that constituted an act of duress. There was another case uh, I was also involved with uh, on behalf of the, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and it dealt with a Picasso. Uh, and a similar kind of argument was made where the original owner um, sold uh, a Picasso uh, in Italy, uh, in fascist Italy, uh, as he was fleeing. Um, and he did successfully flee. He sold it to a dealer in France. Uh, the negotiation period uh, was, um, it took a, 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 about a year uh, of back and forth. Um, and the sale was for fair market value at the time. Uh, and so an argument was made that, yeah, but it wouldn't have been sold but for the rise of fascism. And, and so it was uh, basically an argument of duress by circumstances, an environment of, of duress. Um, and the lower court in that case rejected that argument, uh, again, under the same approach. Um, and so this is a very tricky issue. This is a, a controversial one, um, but that's how it uh, came out in the Bacalar case and in this other case. Um, and that's the significance of the power of attorney. Great. Jane, did you have anything to say about that? About um, the power of attorney? No, not about the power of attorney, but the, the power of attorney, oh, power of attorney given to Lily. Yeah, sure. Yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. I mean, do you have a specific question for me, David? Because I think really, you know, a, a power of attorney we, is a legal document, and that's why I thought Bill should take that question. You know, the, the, the fact is that, you know, to sum up, what we know about the Grunbaum collection is that Lily had it stored with a shipping company, Schenker, with the anticipation that she would be leaving and that the art would be leaving. And we don't really know what happened after that. Uh, you know, and it, you know how, it, I mean, if, I mean, we know that at least one of those works, Dead City, ended up with Matilda Lukacs in Belgium and she brought it to Kornfeld in Bern. Uh, so how did that work get from Vienna to Belgium when? Did it go from Vienna to Belgium? We, we don't know. You know, it, this is all speculation. Uh, and I think, you know, the point of my presentation was there really is a limit to 
what you can do at this point with such scanty evidence. I mean, it would be nice if we could right all the wrongs of the Holocaust, but there are, you know, in, in many cases, it's just too late. Right, okay, uh, another question. To what extent can dealers be the driving force in finding and developing claims against museums on behalf of families? And what are the ethics of this? Well, that's a loaded question. Yeah, that sure is. I, I, I will well, wait, There's more, there's, 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 it, there's even more. And uh, uh, I am curious because I saw a few years ago that Gagosian was selling a Picasso portrait that the National Gallery of Art in Washington had returned to the descendants of the original owner. So double barrel there. Do you want to take that, Jane? Yeah, I will. I, will I mean, OK, so uh, in general, I don't think dealers are spearheading claims. And I don't think that Gagosian had anything to do, at least I haven't heard that, with the claim against the National Gallery. Um, you know, what does happen with a lot of these claims is, first of all, these claims are mostly only made for very valuable paintings. It's a lot of Holocaust loot that is never going to be recovered, never going to be researched because it simply isn't worth enough. And this is a growth business for certain attorneys who are working on, you know, fairly high contingency fees. Um, in the case of the National Gallery Picasso, um, I don't know the facts of that case. One of my mottos is always, every case is different. You don't want to jump to conclusions without reading all of the documents. Uh, but the National Gallery said when they gave back the Picasso that they were not acknowledging that there was any evidence of theft. They were simply doing it to avoid the costs and, and probably also publicity of litigation. Maybe so do you have anything to, to add to the, the, the National Gallery case or Elizabeth? Yeah. Anybody else? Not now to the National Gallery case, but I just wanted to, and Bill, please correct me if I'm wrong, just as a coda to that, I, I recall with the Grunbaum, Sheila, the legal fees actually eclipsed what it, what it, what it ended up selling for at auction, um, just to, to speak to how much money is involved in research and defending these, it, it sometimes is it overwhelming the actual value of the work of art itself. I won't answer that specifically, but uh, but I will say it was whenever you have a litigation going on over eight years, it's going to be very expensive. Uh, and um, uh, you know, Mr. Bacalar uh, was able to to support that, um, and was and was you know I think uh, offended uh, that he was being accused of uh, you know being unsympathetic. Uh, and turning a blind eye and almost being complicit in, in alleged theft that we were able to prove didn't occur. And we were able to prove it on, on really good quality evidence. Um, so, you know, to have a client who's able to kind of stand his ground that way and support it uh, is very important, but no question, uh, litigation is an expensive adventure. All right, well, those are the questions we have. Uh, they're very good ones. So. Thank you all, and thank you, Elizabeth Goreyeb, Jane Kalir, and Bill Sharon. And good night, everyone. Thank, thank you, you, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>